may be seated. Please open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2 this morning. Revelation chapter 2. We have been blessed to hear Lisa's testimony of God's faithfulness through her ministry this summer. And now we pray this morning as well for our team that's currently in South Dakota. They left yesterday, our 180 team. And, uh, you know, fall is coming. We will all be back together eventually, right? <laughs> We've been on the move this summer. Uh, but join me as we pray, not only for our team in South Dakota, but also for God to meet us now in His Word. Father, You are a great and awesome God. <clears throat> You're Lord over all the earth. There's not a square inch on this globe that You are not Lord over. We thank You this morning, Father, that because of that, we can have confidence that wherever Your people go, in whatever they endeavor to do, you are there, and you are at work. Father, we pray for our team as they serve in, in South Dakota this week. We pray that you will bless them with strength and protection. Bless them with selfless hearts to serve sacrificially. Bless them with great love for one another. Bless them to be a blessing to those they serve. And Lord, we pray that you will work in unexpected ways. And that the work that you do will have lasting fruit. So Lord, we entrust our team to you this morning. And now, Father, we ask that in our own hearts and minds, Holy Spirit, you'd be actively, presently working, pressing beyond the distractions, causing our hearts to be tender, to respond quickly and fully to the promptings of your Spirit as we listen to you speak through your inspired Word, which is without error. So Lord, in these moments, I, I pray, Holy Spirit, I need your help. God, I'm just a man. And I need your help this morning to serve your people, not in my own strength, but in the strength you supply, not in my own wisdom, but in the wisdom you've given through your Word and by your Spirit. So Lord, this morning, will you meet us here we give you praise and thanks that you never, you never forsake our request to have you work in and among us. So we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In the year 150 A.D., we mark the death of uh, one of the most famed martyrs of Christendom, a man by the name of Polymar Polycarp, who became a believer under the ministry of the Apostle John and eventually became the bishop or the overseer of Smyrna. And I just forgot, uh, come on up, Colin. I was going to have him read the scripture this morning, and uh, I didn't do that. So come on up, brother, and read for us. <laughs> come on, no, come on up, read for us, brother. And then I'll jump back in. <laughs> oh, good morning. I'm just going to read, uh, we're going to read the scripture passage from the book of Revelation. Uh, looking forward to hearing you preach ah, this morning, brother. brother. Um, so it's book of Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Yeah, in the ESV, English Standard Version. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write... The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you. This is the word of the Lord. So in the year 150, Polycarp was martyred for his faithfulness to Christ. As I mentioned, he, was, uh, he came to Christ under the ministry of the Apostle John himself and then later became the bishop or the overseer of the very church we're studying this morning, the city, the church in the city that we're studying this morning, the church of Smyrna. 
Rome had been executing Christians for their faith in the arena, and they were looking for Polycarp. They were trying to track him down. And by arresting and torturing one of Polycarp's servants, the proconsul discovered where Polycarp was staying, and they came to arrest him. When the soldiers arrived, Polycarp uh, fed them, and then he asked if he could be permitted one hour to pray before he was hauled off to the arena. The soldiers, a bit taken back by his fearlessness and composure, granted his request, and for two hours, Polycarp prayed for every Christian he knew, for the church around the world, and for the soldiers who had come to arrest him. When brought before the proconsul, Polycarp was given a, a, a final chance to live. He needed only to renounce Christ, and his life would be spared. In response, Polycarp spoke his famous words. Eighty-six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Again, the proconsul urged him to swear allegiance to Caesar, but Polycarp replied, Since you vainly think that I will swear by the fortune of Caesar, as you say, and pretend not to know who I am, listen carefully. I am a Christian. When further threats to send Polycarp into the arena to face wild animals were proved ineffective, the proconsul finally ordered Polycarp's death by fire. And yet reports of his death claim that when the fire sprang up, it, it formed an arc around his body like in a wind tunnel, and did not consume him, and so the Romans stabbed Polycarp, and he bled to death. Although Polycarp's death was a number of years after the writing of Revelation, I, I share it with you this morning because Polycarp was not only the bishop of Smyrna, the church we're, right, we're, we're reading about this morning, I also share it to demonstrate the kind of persecution that the church faced under Rome in the first century. One of the seven cities mentioned in, uh, excuse me, of the seven cities mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3, Smyrna is, is only one of two churches out of seven that Jesus did not rebuke for their lack of faithfulness in some way to the Lord. It's the only church who is still, in, uh, the only city that is, that is still inhabited today. In fact, uh, the, the city of Smyrna was destroyed in 600 B.C., but was rebuilt by Alexander the Great approximately 350 years before the writing of the book of Revelation. So it's interesting here, as we get into the language of the text, we hear Jesus talking about the one who died and was raised to life. There's a bit of a death-resurrection history with Smyrna they were known for, but more importantly, it's not about Smyrna. It's about Christ and what he represents for his people. Smyrna was called the most beautiful of all cities and was well known for its allegiance to Rome. In fact, it became the center uh, for, for the imperial cult, that is, for the worship of the Roman emperors. Furthermore, Smyrna was home to several temples dedicated to particular gods and goddesses. In other words, it was a concentrated pagan city where Christianity faced both religious and political opposition. Furthermore, and this is important especially to our study this morning, Smyrna had a large Jewish population. And at this time, Rome recognized Judaism as a legitimate religion, though of course the Jews were compromising to stay in Rome's favor. Unbelieving Jews who rejected Christ viewed Christianity as an aberration, and Rome viewed Christianity suspiciously as a new religion. Thus, many Jews in the Roman Empire would slander Christians to distance themselves from Christianity and, to, to, uh, and, and act as informants to Rome to maintain Jewish favor with Rome in attempts to avoid persecution themselves. 
And this is precisely what was happening several decades later when Polycarp was martyred. Ironically, life in Smyrna for Christians bore a similarity to life in Germany for the Jews in the 1940s. It's hard to thrive when you're constantly looking over your shoulder for informants, and the result is you end up living in poverty and under the threat of death almost constantly. So, given the situation in the city of Smyrna for the believers there, how was the church doing under such severe pressure? Well, as I mentioned earlier, Smyrna was one of two out of only, only two out of seven churches that Jesus does not rebuke in these letters in Revelation. He only commands and encourages them to remain faithful. Smyrna is a healthy church. It's a healthy church. Now, some of us might have the idea that a healthy church is a church without problems. <laughs> not necessarily so. We might think that a healthy church is a church that's just abounding in peace and prosperity, but not so in, not so in Smyrna. One of the, the overarching mark of health in the church of Smyrna was faithfulness under severe pressure. They didn't give in. They refused to give in to the pressure of the culture around them. They refused to compromise even under the threats of imprisonment and death. Now, with that background in mind this morning, can you understand why Jesus addresses Smyrna the way he does in Revelation 2, verse 8? To the angel in the church of Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Who is speaking here? Jesus, the one who has already walked through death and experienced the reality of resurrection life. In other words, Jesus is saying, fear not. I am sovereign over death and life. Jesus' words in verse 8 point us back to chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, where Jesus said, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. No one else. Jesus alone has the keys of death and Hades. Here Jesus reminds these believers facing the threat of death that he is sovereign over history from beginning to end as the eternal one who existed before creation and will reign supremely for all eternity. <clears throat> Yet shockingly, the eternal one, the almighty God in the person of Jesus Christ, died. And through his death, he proved that he was sovereign over death, being raised to life everlasting. Furthermore, Jesus died at the hands of evil men, prompted by Satan himself, so that through Jesus' resurrection, he demonstrates his triumph over man and Satan. In other words, Jesus is saying to the believers in Smyrna, who are, who are vulnerable to evil men and under the influence of Satan, I have already walked the road you face. I've already walked the road you face. There is nothing that can threaten you that I have not already overcome. Fear not. Jesus is sovereign over death and life. Secondly, be encouraged. Jesus is intimately aware of your suffering. Look at verse 9 now. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are, uh, but are a synagogue of Satan. The slander of unbelieving Jews resulted in tribulation for the church in Smyrna. Believers were marginalized. People refused to, 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 refused to buy and sell to them because they don't want to be associated with those uh, to whom Rome is opposed. It's all about self-preservation. You get that? 
And this tribulation and persecution results in severe poverty for the believers in Smyrna. But Jesus says, I know your tribulation. <clears throat> and when Jesus says this, he uses the word oida. The sense is, I see. I am con- consciously aware. Nothing you suffer escapes my scrutiny. We know from verse 8 that this is not merely factual knowledge that Jesus is talking about. Jesus himself has experienced the slander of evil men and the torturous persecution of Satan even unto death. Jesus knew material poverty on this earth. Yet he never lacked the immaterial joy of spiritual riches that were lavished on him by his Father. Jesus did not look to life on this earth as his ultimate treasure. And those who are in Christ, we who are in Christ, one with him by faith, share in the eternal inheritance of God's Son as well. This is why Jesus says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. You are rich. The world may inflict poverty on you, but you have an inheritance coming that is immeasurable with every blessing. We get a foretaste of this eternal inheritance now through the presence and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Church, if you have hope and if you have truth, you are rich. If you have forgiveness and freedom from sin's guilt, you are rich. If you've been set free from shame, the shame of your past, you are rich. If you have assurance of eternal life with endless joy and blessing, you are rich. If you are loved by God and His people, you are rich. If you you are free from trying to prove yourself or always trying to be someone, you are rich. If you are free from always trying to be recognized or impress other people or always defending yourself, you are rich. If your identity is based not in what you do or how you perform, but in God's love and favor, you are rich. The power of the Holy Spirit enables you to love and to serve even sacrificially. The power of the Holy Spirit enables you to to live selflessly, to overcome bitterness and fear, to grow less depraved and more like Christ, to strengthen you in your suffering, to give you wisdom, to provide for your needs. Church, you are rich. Beyond all the blessings of this life that come from walking under the umbrella of God's grace, you have an eternal inheritance that defies imagination an inheritance of joy void of suffering, sin, or disappointment. You may work a less than minimum wage job now, but you have a multi-billion dollar inheritance awaiting for you, to say the least. You are rich. This is why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, we are treated as having nothing, yet possessing nothing everything for a while we had a a driver a delivery driver who would come by the church once a week driving one of the delivery trucks you know now that we order everything online these days you know and uh he was uh, unlike most of our delivery guys just pop in the door pop out hey hey here here thank you bye and they're gone that's that's about as much interaction you get but not this guy no he always had something to say very talkative guy and Usually he was hot and sweaty from working in the back of his box truck. And he said, oh, it's so hot out there. It's 109 degrees in the back of my truck. And uh, he was so ready to be done with his job. And uh, one day he came and said, but I'm not working much longer, not much longer. I said, why? What's going on? He said, well, I'm getting my inheritance pretty soon. Pretty, apparently it's going to be a pretty big inheritance. And we, day after day, he would come and he'd say, not many more days, I'm getting my inheritance, I'm going to get my inheritance. I don't know if he was getting paid more than minimum wage or not, I have no idea what he was getting paid, but to him, he was working a, a basic job, but his perspective was fixed on what was to come. 
I don't know if he ever got it or not. I don't know whatever happened with that situation. Church, don't lose your perspective. Don't compromise eternal wealth for earthly uh, security or comfort. Don't exchange the fear of God for the fear of man because those who are tempted, th- those who we are tempted to fear will face the scrutiny of a holy God. Let's go to the end of verse 9. Here Jesus addresses those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. This is a a stinging rebuke of those who are persecuting the believers in Smyrna. They say, and they, they probably believe, they are the people of God. They're doing all the religious, traditional stuff that they believe is the right thing to do. And yet, Jesus says, they're a gathering of Satan's minions that is they are doing satan's work in the name of religion in the name of god church beware that even today some claim to be god's people and call themselves a church they may even use the bible to a degree yet they deny that the bible is fully inspired by god they deny that the bible is without error they believe they can reinterpret and rewrite portions of the bible And they contradict the moral ethics of the Bible because they they are weak and fearful of the world's disfavor. You must not accept something simply because it comes with a Christian label or from a Christian source, so to speak. You have to know the Bible well enough to discern the difference between the world and the things of God and to stand firm in the truth when it's costly And this leads to the final point of our passage this morning. Be steadfast. Be steadfast. Jesus will give the crown of life to those who are faithful unto death, untouched by the second death. Verse 10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days, you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death death verses 10 and 11 are loaded (laughs) they are an an exhortation a warning and an encouragement all together at the same time so we'll take them one at a time here let's begin in the middle of verse 10 with the warning the warning by warning here i mean simply that jesus is preparing them for what's about to happen the devil is about to throw some of you in prison that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Well, they're already experiencing tribulation, but it's about to get a lot worse. The real test is coming. Jesus is saying, beware, church, the heat is about to be turned up. So how will the devil throw some of them into prison? Well, by the hands of religious yet godless men duped by Satan. Remember Ephesians 6, 11, and 12, where Paul urges us to to put on the full armor of God that we may be able to stand firm, stand firm against the schemes of the devil because our struggle is ultimately not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of wickedness. So Satan will influence people to throw Christians into prison. And I want you to keep in mind this morning that prison in the first century was a miserable detention for those awaiting trial and most often execution. Today, prison is kind of like the end of the line. Pretty rare exception when somebody gets punished beyond prison, right? With the death penalty or something like that. But not so in the first century. Prison was just the on-ramp 
to your execution. Now notice this important phrase in the middle of verse 10. That you may be tested. That you may be tested. This is really important. This reveals the purpose for what they are about to go through. It's a test. It's a test. The question is, who's behind the testing? Is it God? Is it Satan? Or is it the people who oppress them? It's important to note that the Greek grammar here is in the passive. Now, when the translators of the NIV uh, Uh, translated this verse to get it into a smoother cleaner English they simply translated it as uh, the devil's about to throw you into prison to test you it's actually not the best translation it it translates as active but the grammar is actually passive in Greek and so the more awkward reading in the New American Standard and the ESV is actually more accurate where it says the devil's about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. Now it's unclear as to who is doing the testing. We know Satan's going to throw them into prison, but who's doing the testing when he throws them into prison? That's less clear here. Indicates that something more complicated than simple may be happening in this verse. And I want to remind you of something this morning. There's always more than one will at work in any given situation, typically speaking, right? God is working out His will. Satan is working to accomplish His will. And people are working according to their own will under the influence of either the Spirit or the flesh and the devil. Furthermore, God's purposes are always good and Satan's purposes are always evil. So we could say that three things are true in any given situation. First, God's will is resolutely set on holy purposes for good. Let's say it together, church. God's will is resolutely set on holy purposes for good. That's the first thing. The second thing is that Satan's will is resolutely set on evil purposes for destruction. Let's say it together. Satan's will is resolutely set on evil purposes for for destruction. Pretty big difference, right? God is always working for good. Satan's always working for evil. God's will is resolute on holy and good purposes. Satan's will is resolute on evil and destructive purposes. But there's a third thing we need to be aware of. Our will is not absolutely resolute. Right? That means we are torn between sin and righteousness. We are torn between good and evil. And so we have to make a choice. This is where life gets messy. We've got to make a choice. And we have desires within us that are conflicting. Will you respond to God's holy and good purposes for you? Or will you respond to the devil's evil and destructive purposes for you in a given situation? So this is, this is really significant. This is, this is worth coming to church for right here. This is why we came today, okay? Okay. Because this means that a single situation can be both a temptation from the devil and a test from God at exactly the same time. Are you with me? And they are, those two different purposes from, from Satan and God are opposed to one another, but in the same situation. Let me show you an example of this from the life of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Can you throw that on the screen? Do we have that on the screen? I hope I put that on the screen. Bummer, I did not put that on the screen. Okay, let me read again. Listen very carefully. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay? Okay? I wish we had it in front of us. If you don't have it in front of you, let's take a moment to study verse, this, this verse in Matthew 4, 1. Who was Jesus led by? The Spirit. Okay, that's clear. Where did the Spirit lead Jesus? The wilderness. Good. Wow, you guys listen really well. That's great. Wilderness. For what purpose did the Spirit lead Jesus to the wilderness to be 
tempted and who was Jesus tempted by? The devil. What's happening in this verse is very similar to the book of Job. God allowed Satan a certain amount of leash to act on his will to tempt Job severely, and yet God was working out his greater purposes to test Job and to prove his faith as genuine. Do you see what's going on here? In the wilderness with with Jesus, the Spirit leads him out there. God's holy purpose and his intent is to demonstrate the provenness of Jesus' faithfulness and the provenness of his righteousness through the tempting temptation of Satan, who is in, who's legitimately trying, or uh, uh, who's authentically trying to entice Jesus to sin. Just as Job, Je- God said, Satan, you, you got this much leash, you could do this and no more. He allowed Job to be tested. Satan legitimately legitimately wanted to cause Job to sin and to curse God, but God was doing it to prove Job's faith. Now let me point out how this relates to Revelation chapter 2. The word tempted in Matthew 4.1, the word tempted comes from the Greek word Parazo. Okay? Parazo. That, that's important for today, so just hang on for a second. Because this is the same word in Revelation 2.10 translated as tested. That you may be tested. Parazo. Tempted. Tested. So this Greek word, we're going to do a little Greek lesson this morning. It's worth it. This could actually affect your life every day. This Greek word, parazo, no, go back, go back. There we go, thank you. We'll we'll hang out there for a second. Thank you, Beth. Parazo can be translated either way. It can be translated to test or to tempt. How do we know which way to translate it when we come across it in the New Testament? It has to be by the context. So if the context is one in which a a person is uh, to be approved as faithful, we, we translate it as test. If, if, it's, if it, the context is one in which a person is being enticed to evil or sin, we translate it as tempt. And as you can see, God is the one who stands behind the testing and Satan is the one who stands behind the tempting. So what does this have to do with everyday life? Well, this means that whenever you face a temptation where you are enticed by the devil to sin, it is also a God-given test whereby you can demonstrate your faithfulness to God by not giving in to the temptation. This can change the way you battle lust. It can change how you uh, address overeating or bitterness or whatever vice you may be facing in your life. In any temptation, it's not just about the thing. It's not about the food. It's not about the alcohol. It's not about the lust. It's about making a choice between your loyalty to God or Satan. God or your flesh. The Spirit or the flesh. When you face a temptation, it is a God-given opportunity for you to say, I will be faithful to Christ. I will stand God's promises are better. So what's happening in Revelation 2.10 is that Satan is about to throw them into prison to tempt them to forsake Christ, but God is allowing it as a test to prove their faithfulness to Jesus. So, Jesus warns them And he not only warns them of what is about to happen, he exhorts them now. He exhorts them to not fear and to be faithful unto death. Verse 10. Let's read it again. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. How how do we do this? 
How, how do you not fear? Jesus says, don't fear. Really? How, how do we not fear when we are facing death by torture and execution? C- can you simply decide not to feel fear? <laughs> well, I haven't been there, uh, but given my lesser suffering in life, maybe not. But I don't think Jesus is merely speaking to what we feel, but how we respond, what we do with what we feel. Maybe possible. Maybe maybe it's possible that God in His grace delivered Polycarp from the actual experience of fear in those moments. Maybe He did. I don't know. Or maybe He was sick to His stomach. Well, He did the right thing. I don't know. But at the very least... We may experience fear, and, but Jesus is saying, don't be paralyzed or controlled by it. Are you going to be mastered by the things you fear? Are you going to be mastered by the one who's sovereign over the things you fear? Keep your heart anchored to what is ultimately true. And this is where Jesus' encouragement now enters into verses 10 and 11. It's a threefold encouragement. First, Their tribulation, though it will be severe, very severe, be faithful unto death. That's severe. It will be for a short period of time. It's temporary. It's temporary. Jesus is not necessarily saying that after you, you go through the you go through what feels like hell for 10 days and then you'll be good. That's not necessarily what he's saying. It's likely they'll go through 10 days of this torturous tribulation and then die. And then they're good. But Jesus is saying, remember, this is not eternity. Keep your eyes on what is unseen. Next, Jesus encourages them that if they are faithful unto death, He will give them the crown of life. This death is about life. Eternal life. The crown of life here refers to Everlasting life, life after death. Remember, the one who is speaking to them is the one who died and came to life. That's what Jesus said in verse 8. He's offering the same promise of resurrection he himself has already fulfilled. This is so rich. Jesus stands with them before the Galatine. He stands with them in the arena. He stands with them on the woodpile when it's being lit. And he says, I have gone ahead of you. Follow me. This is my road. Let's go. I hold the keys of death and Hades. I alone give the crown of life. Don't stop now. Jesus' final encouragement is found in verse 11. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. What is the second death? The second death refers to the lake of fire in Revelation 20, verse 6. Eternal hell. Everlasting judgment. Interestingly, in the city of Smyrna, their pagan temples were connected by a series of buildings, a, literally a mall, called the Crown of Smyrna. The Crown of Smyrna. So these believers must make a choice between the crown of Smyrna and its pagan ways that will only lead to the second death or the crown of eternal life offered by Christ to those who are faithful unto death. What is Jesus doing? He's giving his church eyes to see what they need to see in the greatest test of their life. To see eternity And not lose sight of that in the face of momentary torture and death. Do you see the clear choice? Faithfulness to God when it costs you this life or lesser things or compromise and apostasy at the cost of eternal judgment. Apostasy or you know, denying the faith, happens when people compromise obedience to God out of the fear of man. But Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body, 
but are unable to kill the soul. That's why we sang a mighty fortress today. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. That's Jesus. That's not Martin Luther. That's Jesus. Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear Him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Friends, the most foolish thing you could do is compromise your loyalty to God out of, out of fear of man because man can only kill the body, but God can damn the soul. It's utterly foolish. Furthermore, God can save the soul and resurrect the body. <laughs> so I would, I would just suggest to you that one of the life principles that we can hang on to as we walk through this life is this. You need to know a little about people and a lot about God. Right? Because even in knowing a little, bit, a little bit about people, you might get it wrong, and even if you do and they take advantage of you or they injure you or they ruin you, oh well. What's more important is what you know about God and that He's at the end. And He's the one who vindicates His people. So don't get so focused on avoiding the first death, physical death, that you succumb to the second death of eternal judgment. So easy to lose our perspective and, 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 and get skewed and how dangerous that can be. Earlier this summer, uh, we, when we were in Washington, we had a great time out there, and, and uh, you know how it is. We, we flew out there, and we get there. It's late at night. We go to the rental car place to rent a car, which we were glad to have. And, you know, the, even the parking garage was kind of dark by then. It wasn't very well lit. And we go out there, and the like, first thing you got to do is walk around the rental car, and you got to check for all the damage because you don't want to be responsible for the first 4,000 miles worth of damage. You only had 4,000 miles on it. It's pretty cool. We're going to kind of drive a new car, feeling kind of posh here uh, until I started getting nervous about I'm responsible for this thing and they're not going to have any mercy on me if I crash this thing. So we took off and, you know, it's kind of a recipe for disaster. Uh, you're driving a vehicle you've never driven before. You don't know where anything is. Where are the headlights on this thing again? And uh, and and uh, you're driving an area you've never been. You don't know any of the road system at all, and it's dark outside. Perfect, great recipe for disaster. And so it's okay. We got going. I think kind of everybody in the car is a little nervous about Dad's driving this new car we first took off, and and we kind of settling down here, you know, navigating through the interstate, heading from Seattle north. Uh, a couple hours after a couple hours of driving, I'm getting a little more comfortable with the vehicle. Well, we're doing good. We're doing fine. And drive along. All of a sudden, I see a sign that says roundabout. Well, I'm from Minnesota. I know all about roundabouts. I started slowing down a little bit, and then I, I could see, I could physically see the roundabout with my eyes, even though it was dark. out. You know, they're, they're kind of raised up, you know, and sometimes you have stuff in the middle to kind of make them obvious. And I, I could see the roundabout. My eyes fixed on it, no problem. I got some time yet to slow down. What I didn't realize, there was another roundabout between the one I could see and where I was. It wasn't raised very high. There was nothing in the middle. And I've got my eyes fixed on this roundabout out there, and pretty soon we feel the vehicle go, woo, over the first roundabout. <laughs> yeah. And the only thing that would go through my mind that moment was, rental car! <laughs> Yo, rental car! I should have taken out that extra insurance. Thank God that we weren't injured. The car wasn't injured. We did fine other than my pride, which got harassed for the next <laughs> 10 days. All for your sake, all for your benefit, right, for this moment. I was so focused on the one that I could see, the one that consumed my attention that I missed the other and risked the uh, ran the risk of ruining not only the vehicle but endangering my family friends if we allow the fear of man the intimidation of people the fear of physical death or suffering to consume our vision we run the risk of succumbing to the second death of eternal ruin 
Well, I trust that none of us will face persecution to the point of physical death this week. Yet overcoming such severe tests begin with faithfulness in the smaller temptations. Church, you know it. We we live in a world that wants to silence any voice of truth. Every day we need to make a choice between the fear of man and the fear of God. All the time. It can happen in obvious ways when we, when we choose to be silent on our convictions or our association with Christ to avoid people's disapproval or our embarrassment or whatever it may be. Or it can happen in more subtle ways like avoiding situations because I feel insecure or I'm more focused on what others will think of me than how Jesus might want me to serve them. Remember, church, your identity and your security are in Christ. His love for you, not other people's opinions, is all that ultimately matters. You are free, church. You are free. You are free to be who Christ is calling you to be as you follow Him. You are free to stand in the truth. You are free to not cave in to the pressures of this society around you. You are free, and in that freedom, you are rich because Jesus stands with you in that freedom. So be faithful. Be faithful, Jesus says, and I will give you the crown of life. It's not that we earn heaven by our faithfulness. That's not what we're talking about. But rather that our faithfulness proves the genuineness of our faith, that Christ is sufficient and He's enough to hold us and to anchor our hearts. When the cost of following Christ is death to any degree, the reward of faithfulness to Christ is life. So I want to close this morning with the words of James 1.12. Blessed is the man. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, once he passed the test, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Father, we're so thankful this morning. You have not left us to ourselves. You've not called us to obedience that we cannot Possible, we couldn't possibly attain on our own. No, you, you sent Christ to make a way. And you sent the Spirit to empower us to walk in that way. And so we thank you this morning, Lord God. God, I pray for myself. I pray for my brothers and sisters here today. Lord God, every day we face temptation, temptation, temptation. And oh, how weak we are so often in the face of that temptation, but you have come, Holy Spirit, to strengthen us in the power of Christ, in the blood-bought power of Christ, to stand, to be faithful, to demonstrate that Christ is better. So Lord, strengthen us. Use each test to strip us of our weakness, so that you will be honored in our lives by the very faith that you yourself sustain in us. God, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world today. Some of them are living out Revelation 2.10. Some are in prison. Some face death. Some are in poverty. Some don't know how to protect their families. And they make hard choices. But God, we pray, be their strength. Be their wisdom. Give them eyes to see the ultimate treasure of faithfulness to Christ. And Lord, Teach us to love those around us, even those 
who would slander us and inform against us. Like Polycarp, teach us to truly pray and be faithful. Not to follow his example, but to follow Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing together truth.